Revolution, a new sports biography revealing the incredible true story of Mikel Arteta's success at Arsenal Football Club. To November 2019, Unai Emery's final game as Arsenal manager sees the Gunners languishing eighth in the league. Appointed in the dying embers of the Wenger years, Emery's 18 months as Arsenal boss has seen his team and his club go backwards. What happens next? is the story of Arteta's Arsenal and it's been written by Charlie Watson. Charlie joins me live on the line. Morning to you, Charlie. Good morning, Giles. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'll put my cards on the table. I'm a Chelsea fan, so here we go. Now then, (laughs) tell me a little bit about... Because Wenger had basically created a team, a legacy, the unbeatables, uh, you know, a team the you know with names like Parler, for example, in a Terry, Thierry Henry, Bergkamp. I mean, it was it was quite something. And I suppose the thing is, what you know, where do you go when that comes? That goes full circle. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It was a it was an amazing era to be an Arsenal fan. It feels an awful long time ago now. Um, back then I was just a fan sitting in the stands at Highbury every week getting to see those players week in week out you know doing what they did and it was an unbelievable time but yeah the club kind of lost its way a little bit after that obviously the move to the Emirates the the finances pretty much collapsing because all of the money was being pumped into the stadium and paying off the stadium and um, and yeah the whole the whole sort of picture at Arsenal changed for a long long time they got close a little bit during that era the sort of the second decade of Wenger but could never quite get themselves over the line and um and then it kind of all ended in a bit of, sort of fractious divide and it was a really it wasn't it wasn't a very fun time to be an Arsenal fan towards the end of Arsenal because the fan base was so split the club felt split you know you were sort of going to games because you felt like you had to because obviously you're a fan but not you weren't really going to games looking forward to what it was going to be like because the as I said the atmosphere was pretty toxic and you know Unai came in at the end of that and had a really difficult job on his hands, you know, it was never going to be easy replacing Wenger. And after this sort of initial uplift, it, it started to fall apart pretty quickly. And it was pretty obvious that he wasn't really the right man for the job. He didn't have the, just didn't command the respect to the players. Communication was a big, big issue. And the club just needed someone to come in and sort of drag it up again and, and just grasp it by the sort of scruff of the neck and, and just put it in a direction where there was direction basically, because it felt very rudderless up to that point. And, you know, they made the call, they appointed, they brought in Mikel Arteta, which was a risk, you know, that no previous experience uh, other than, you know, Pep's assistant at Manchester City. And and they made the call a couple, about 18 months after overlooking him in the first place for for um, Frunai. And, you know, so you look at it now four years down the line from that, and it's been a very, very smart move by the club. A couple of things on that one. It's an interesting point, isn't it? Because on that cusp, as as football's evolved and we've gone and all the money's been pumped into to the Premiership and football clubs have become businesses and got bigger stadiums, not saying better stadiums, but, you, you know, looking at the West Ham going to the London Stadium, you look at, you know, what's been happening with Spurs with their move. You know, they become, if you like, multinational brands. But then if you build a new stadium, A, you've got to pay for it, as you said, which means you can't you know the investors or the business and honestly returns and 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 b you lose some of that tremendous atmosphere that you had at highbury that you, you know that you had at white hart lane uh, that you had at upton park yeah you do you know as i said i was a fan during the highbury years and um and it was just a really special place it still is you know you're just walking around it now it, it still gives me goosebumps when i walk past the place and the emirates has never had that it's just you know i'd go back to highbury in an instant if you if I could. And um, the Emirates has never really had that atmosphere until last season. It, it feels like a different stadium now. I have to say it's it's vibrant. It's young. I think post-COVID, the kind of the dynamic of fan in the crowd has changed. It's definitely a younger fan at Arsenal now. Um, you're seeing that in a way, uh, a way, the way support as well. And, um, you know, since Mikel Arteta arrived, he made it very clear. Like the first thing he did when he walked into his first press conference when I was there, um, he sat down and said, we need the fans on our side because he knew that that relationship had broken down pretty badly towards the end of Arsenal and during the United Emery time. And he knew, if, you know, if you, if you want to be a successful football club, everyone has to be pulling in the same direction and um, and to sort of get that atmosphere and that support. And it was really, really apparent last year. You know, everyone's bought into this project at the, at the ground. It was a really fun season last season, even though it ended in disappointment in the end. Um, but that connection that had been lost 
after so many years of sort of, as I said, fractious divide within the fan bases, it just came back last year. And I think that's why everyone got caught caught up in it and, and really sort of rode the roller coaster together. And you say you've been overlooked the first time around and he, you know, he hadn't really done something like this. But if you're going to be somebody's assistant manager, then Pep Guardiola yeah. has got to be, you know, quite, quite, quite one to, to be an assistant too. Because look at Pep's record across everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you just look at some of the people who have sort of played under him now and what they're doing. You know, Vincent Company at Burnley was fantastic. Enzo Maresca has gone to Leicester and, you know, doing a fantastic job in the championship now, playing wonderful football. You know, Pep's got his disciples everywhere pretty much. And, um, you know, when he's long gone, he's still going to have players that he's been, you know, schooling or coaches that he's been schooling that are going to continue to to play the way that Pep plays. You know, he's just changed the game. It's just plain and simple. He has changed the game. He's the best manager there is in the modern era. and um, and unfortunately for Arsenal and everyone else, it doesn't look like he's going anywhere, anywhere, anytime soon as well. But the, the other thing as well is, and, and obviously, as I said before, being a Chelsea fan, I know everything about this. It's, it's backing your manager and consistency and sticking with him in the hard times. Because obviously at Chelsea, we have, a, we have a long and proud tradition of sticking with our managers, not. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. And, and, you know, I talk about this a lot in the book. You know, there was a lot of times, although where Arsenal are now from where they were when Mikel took over is fantastic and they've completely changed the outlook of the club and the ambitions of the club has now completely changed. But there were times early on, you know, they could have easily sacked him, easily pulled the trigger and got rid of him because it wasn't going well. You know, I think of his first full season in charge when come sort of December time, they were 15th in the table. I remember travelling back from Goodison Park during the COVID era and, you know, Arsenal just lost going into Boxing Day and, um, like I said, there were four points above the relegation zone. And then they had Chelsea uh, on Boxing Day at the Emirates. And um, and Mikel changed things. He went, he brought in the youngsters, Smith Rowe, Saka, Martinelli all came in and it just all clicked. And Arsenal beat Chelsea. And you, you sort of look at that point as, you know, the sort of start of what we've seen seen from now. And there was some, it was some, he had to go through some really difficult times and the club easily could have panicked and, and pulled the trigger, but they didn't. They stuck with him. They all kind of went into this project or process as it's known at Arsenal um, together and they haven't sort of shied away from it or veered away from it even when it, they, were, they were struggling. So I think, you know, as much as Mikel Arteta deserves a lot of credit for the job he's done in turning things around, you know, the whole club as a whole deserve a lot of credit for the faith that they've put in him. And, and, um, and yeah, I think they, they certainly deserve a lot of credit for that. And also bringing in the youngsters, and that takes from two. That take they didn't do a panic thing, you know, and and good, you know, and bonjour to Paris Saint Germain, and just buy in the biggest players they could possibly get and hope they glue. Which, you know, unless you're Real Madrid with the Galacticos, that doesn't normally work quite well. You could, you can't have a Harlem Globetrotters approach to football and think you're going to buy it. You know, do a team like that. But when you just, just those names that you mentioned now, you know, it's like Saka, who are now not only you know first team starters and and brilliant so for Arsenal, but you know they're they're in the England team, and it takes. Perhaps you know Arteta takes that from from the Barcelona teams that he you know that the Pep had because they were a unit all the way through and even even and I hate to to drop in the accursed Manchester United whilst we're talking but you know that was that was also you know another long term you know a long term uh, manager's project you know Alex Ferguson and and you know that, those academy players that came through those you know those kids that came through you know in, in the nineties um, so it just shows if you stick with a team and you have a philosophy. Um, it's going to it's going to eventually bring results. Yeah, I mean it's absolutely crucial that you you sort of stick to your philosophy and things go wrong. You don't change your mind, but I think you need a little bit of luck along the way as well. You need t- talent first of all, and Arsenal were very fortunate. They, you know, you don't often have a Bukayo Saka coming through the through the academy. You know, you get this little once in a generation type player, and Arsenal, you know, have been very fortunate in that regard. But they've obviously coached him very very well and got the best talent out of him. And when you sort of combine that with like Martinelli, as I said, he's another, you know, he's just flourished into a genuine world superstar now in, in a couple of years since arriving as a Brazilian teenager. You, you make a really smart, you've got to be good in the transfer market and Arsenal have been very, very good in the transfer market. You know, William Saliba, Gabriel uh, Magalhães, Martin Odegaard, I mean, £30 million pounds for Martin Odegaard. It's just in modern terms, it's just uh, the bargain of the century that. And um, so they've been, their recruitment has been very, very good. They've had some really good youngsters come through um, and sort of just combining that, they've got a very good young coach who has come in and uh, sort of moulded it all together. And um, yeah, the the rise in just a short space of time has been, it's been very, very dramatic. And for Arsenal fans, you know, the, it's been a difficult 
sort of 15 years or so, I think from the highs of the, you know, the Venga years, the, the glory years under Venga, which, you know, you only get that. With, well, I mean, you, you never get that. You never go unbeaten. No one's ever done it before yeah. in, in part of Arsenal, which says that that was just, it was such an amazing achievement. And it's like, where do you go from that? Really? Is it, <laughs> there's only one really way you can go from that and that's down. And, and they've certainly went down, but under Arteta, they're certainly on the way back now. But they need to win for something now. They need to build on what's happened in these last few years and really go on and, and achieve something. They got very, very close last year, but they didn't manage to get over the line. Now the big, big challenge is to get past Manchester City. And right now there is no bigger challenge in, in world football than that. Has it always been, was it immediately sort of harmony? Because if you come in, um, you know, as an unknown proposition, he's going to run into, he was going to run into opposition, wasn't he? He was going to run into some fans to go, oh, here we've got, we've got another quote unquote continental coming in. Um, mm. and obviously Wenger now, I mean, he has a, you know, he has a, he has a place amongst the, of, amongst the Arsenal, Arsenal elite, hasn't he? But, uh, presumably he didn't just stroll in and everywhere. Oh, yes. Oh, you know, you're, you're, you're the, the absolute, uh, bee's knees or whatever. No, no, there's lots of opposition. There still is, to be honest. There's still a lot of people who who view him as too inexperienced and too sort of stuck in his ways. And, you know, I mean, you're always going to get that, especially in the world of social media. It's never going to be all smelling of roses, is it? You're going to have one person on one side, another person on the other side fighting all day long. And, and that remains to be the case. But yeah, we only said he had to absolutely um, he had a lot of opposition at the time coming in. He'd never done it before. And suddenly a manager of Arsenal. It's a, it's a huge call for the club. And, you know, he had to make some really big and unpopular decisions. You know, when he arrived, you had Mesut Ozil there, who to many fans was just, you know, this player on an absolute pedestal that you couldn't touch. And Mikel came in and just chucked him out, basically banished him, didn't play him, didn't include him in his squad and ended up going and ended up getting rid of him. And it was huge opposition to that. He annoyed so many people. And he's, you know, he's made the decisions of, Abamyang as well, who's club captain at the time, you know. And, but I think that's something that's really good about Mikel Arteta. He's not scared to make those big decisions. He's so he can be so ruthless. And if he thinks this is the way we, this is what we need to do to be successful, this is what I'm going to do. And I don't care if it's going to annoy people. I don't care if it's going to get, um, if it's going to upset some of the players that I've got in the squad. I'm going to deal with it, and I'm going to deal with it my way. And, and he's done that. And you look at where you look at the squad that he inherited. It was, you know, it was it was so. Players had all the power at Arsenal. You saw that, by the way, Unai Emery went. You know, the players basically just didn't want Unai Emery anymore. They stopped playing for him and he ended up going. And um, they had all the power and he came in and he changed that in an instant. It's like, no, I'm the I'm the boss. I'm going to be the boss. It's my way. Is it You play by my rules. And if you don't, then it doesn't matter if you're captain. Like Aubameyang, if you turn up late for a game, I'm dropping you. You're not playing. And you're, if you turn, if you come back late from a planned trip to Europe, like he did, you're out of the club. You're not yeah. coming back. And that's what he's done. And um, I think Arsenal needed that. They absolutely did. But and that is that is a thing as well, because you're looking at, a, at such a dynamic now with footballers. And it's not so much football as well, but it's, it's the rise of the agent as well, who, you know, from the age of from the age of 12, these guys are told, the, you know, they are the greatest if you're a professional mm. footballer and you, and you get to the thing. And, and some of them act like, I mean, some of them are proper professionals and they go on with the job and the whole thing is fine but some of them try and act as if they are rap stars or whatever and, and with an entourage etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and you see that and thinking they are you know they, they the, the normal rules don't apply to them and it takes it takes a manager with a bit of you know as I say it's Ben Cajonis to stand up there and go no we're not having this and and you're off uh, you know mm-hmm. getting your baby Bentley and, and, and you know off you go to Paris Saint-Germain sort of thing yeah and that's what he's exactly what he did it's exactly what he did he came in he sorted the chain he sorted the dressing room out really, really quickly. There was no, you know, anyone who had an ego in that dressing room was when I remember we were talking to Mohamed El Nelly um, last season in the mix zone after one of the games. And it was, it was before the Chelsea game, actually. So it was before Arsenal went and met Aubameyang for the first time after Aubameyang had left and he just, he just signed for Chelsea. And we were talking to El Nelly about Arteta's decision and how that went down in the change room. And he said, you know, we, we were all basically scared of Mikel Arteta after that. If he could do that to the captain, he, he could do it to anyone. And he said, we've just got no egos in this dressing room anymore. And that was the plan from the start. Everyone needs to, Arteta wanted everyone on the same level. No one to have any egos, no one to be the real dross, boss in the dressing room other than him. And, and he did that, you know, and that's why some people still look at that and they say, oh, he's, t- you know, he's, he's too much of a dictator and he, he, he doesn't, he needs to give the players some sort of uh, freedom. And to be fair, he does. But, you know, everyone knows now at Arsenal that the final say is Mikel Arteta's. And if you look, and- at, yeah, if you look at the great teams, 
it's not, the, you know, they're not democracies, they're benign dictatorships, or just, you know, I mean, Ferguson's brilliant teams, I mean, we, everybody knows about the hairdryer treatment, you know, Mar- yeah. no, Mourinho's team, you know, Chelsea team, when it, when it won in Europe, um, you know, they, they all, you know, going back to Clough, I mean, you didn't, they didn't, they didn't muck around, did they? No, they didn't. I think you need in this sort of where we are now in football in this era, I think you need, you do need that. But I think you also need to have a little bit about you in terms of, you know, getting the players on side. I don't think you can just be that sort of firm figure now because, like you said, players have so much power now. They're getting paid so much money that you also need to have that sort of man management side to you as well, that personal touch to you as well as being very, very stern if you have to be. You know, I can't imagine someone like Clough, like, if, for example, in Clough now, I just don't think that would work. You know, you, you couldn't go up and slap a player if they mess around in the change room or something like that. You know, that would be it. You, you know, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't work like that. So you have to kind of, I think you definitely have to have a little bit more about you than that. And I think the best manager, you talk about Mourinho there, you know, Mourinho obviously ran the dressing room at Chelsea, but those players would run through a brick wall for yeah. that Mourinho. Well, your Drogba's, your Terry's, your, your Lampard's. Because, you know, yes, he was the taskmaster, he was stern, but they loved him, you know. And and so I think you need that. It's just sort of, you combine the two now, and I think Mikel's got that very, very well. And again, he's a young manager. Like, you know, he's not in his in his, his late 50s. He's not, you know, in his early 60s. He's, he, you know, he's, he, he looks like he could literally get, go on and do a, a good 15-minute stint if needed to. Yeah, yeah, and that hair's still as pristine as it ever was. Not a blade out of place, lucky man. Um, yeah, he, he, he is very young. It's, it's football now it is a, it's such a young man's game, isn't it? Coaching is getting younger and younger. The old school managers are few and far between now. And um, the thing with Arteta, he's very, very intense, and he lives it every single day. Same as Pep, you know. And Pep has, until now, this is the longest stint he's ever had at a club at Manchester City. He's always sort of been, they've been almost like a short, sharp burst, and then he goes off and needs a recharge because it's been such an intense time. And I think for Arsenal, you know, will Arteta do that? He's got another contract renewal coming up fairly fit soon. I'm pretty confident that that will be signed and he'll stick around. And, um, but I don't see, you know, Wenger be, uh, Arteta being another Wenger and sticking it around for, yeah for two decades I think there's, there, there'll certainly be he'll certainly go at some point for a recharge because he's such an intense figure there's a, there's a, there's a famous story when Pep was at with Barcelona and, and he sat and cried in the dressing room because they'd won everything including the World Club Championship and there was nothing else to win with Barcelona so he had to go and, and do something else you know finishing ahead winning the premiership ahead of Manchester City that, was, that would be a great thing that would be master and pupil wouldn't it but also Arsenal in Europe now that's always been an interesting one hasn't it yeah it is I mean Arsenal, Arsenal in Europe it's not always been a happy marriage you know um, you know, my, myself and my time following Arsenal as a fan and then as a reporter I've been to four European finals and they've lost all four <laughs> <laughs> it's not not a great record and they've lost them in really you know difficult fashion as well penalty shootouts last minute goals from the halfway line by an ex Tottenham player you know getting absolutely hammered by Chelsea and Baku and what a, what a place to, what a final. place to play a European champion what, what a place to play a final in did yeah. you actually go to Baku I went to Baku oh, yeah, and how long did it take you to get there and get back I went via Moscow and, and honestly it was it was just a mad time I remember just sitting there in the stadium in the final I was in the press box and looking around at this half empty stadium with like 4,000 Arsenal fans over there 4,000 Chelsea fans and just thinking this is so rubbish yeah. you know it just didn't feel like a final it felt like a pre-season friendly somewhere and Seeing it was such a joke. Of a See, seeing battle. people from the locals carrying had obviously been given flags to wave as well, which is quite funny. Yeah, it was it was a mad experience. It really was. I mean, I like Baku. I've been over there for a couple of games in the group stages because Arsenal had, had drawn um, had been drawn over there, and um, it's a really nice city. But mm. for a final, it's just absolute madness. It really, it really, really <laughs> was. And, but yeah, I mean, that's something that Arteta has to sort out um, and to prove. I think because. Since he's arrived at the club, even in the Europa League, he got to one semi final, lost to Unai Emery, which obviously, given the narrative of that, it was difficult for him. And they didn't turn up in that semi final. And, uh, you know, other other years, they've, you know, barely got out of the, or they've gone sort of fallen at the first hurdle in the knockout round. So there, there is a question mark over Arteta in Europe and how he sets his teams up. And he needs to show that because I look at the Champions League this year and take Man City out of that. And I don't think there's anyone for, to fear for Arsenal. I think they can go there and they can really go deep into that competition, but he needs to prove he can do that and he he can set his team up to do that. And more importantly, he can rotate his squad enough to have players fit 
and fire in, in Premier League and the Champions League. And I think that's one of the big question marks hanging over him going into this season. And of course, I, you know, when you write a book like this and you are, you know, and I'm one of the Arsenal faithful, it, I mean, and, and the same, you know, what a, what a fantastic job you have, Charlie, 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 to go off and, you know, report on something that you love. But it must be quite difficult sometimes to sort of divorce the, you know, the, the reporter from the fan. Yeah, I think it is. Um, it can be at times. It was last season because last season was such an emotional roller coaster for Arsenal and, you know, no one was expecting it going into the season. Then suddenly, you know, as it went on, it was like, are they going to fall away? They're going to fall away. And then it got to like January, February, March. It's like, well, there's still five points clear at the top of the table. Is it, it, This could actually happen. And like I said, the atmosphere in the ground was, it was just, well, it's, it, it's nothing I've never seen anything like it since the move to the Emirates. And it was just a real emotional ride for everyone. And, you know, they rode that roller coaster for a long, long time and then eventually fell off it right at the end. And um, it was difficult at times to sort of separate that. But, you know, I've been doing, I have been doing the job for a long, long time. So um, I had, you know, I was pretty used to it at that time. But it's still, it sort of doubled the pain, I think, when they ended up losing the title because it was, a, I was writing the book, and for the book, it would have been amazing if yeah. they'd have won the title at the end of it. <laughs> B, I was doing my day job at the time, you know, as Arsenal correspondent for goal. And uh, yeah, and so that was just a real, it was really disappointing writing about the, uh, the the wheels falling off at the end. And, and as a fan, obviously, it was absolutely heartbreaking to watch because he thought for the first time in 20 years, you're actually going to see him potentially lift this trophy. And then just at the, they just ran out of steam right at the, right at the very end. But look, if you're going to finish second to any team, you know, Manchester City is probably the team to do it to, because quite frankly, they should be winning the league every single season. And how do you, you know, I mean, what do you hope that people, because it's not just for the, for the Arsenal faithful in this book. It's a, it's a book about sort of modern football and modern management and, 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 and where we are in the game, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I spent a lot of time looking at, the you know Arteta's philosophy and where it came from his time at La Masia coming through at Barcelona is um you know obsession almost with Johan Cruyff and how that has you know really sort of transformed into his into his coaching career at Arsenal so I spent a lot of time looking back at that at the start of the book um and Arteta himself is what he's like and, you know, what these young managers now, you know, how they can switch off or how they can't switch off for, for many of them as well. So there's lots of that in the book as well as, you know, the journey that, that the, club has, the club has been on. And, you know, it's been very well received so far, which I'm very, very grateful for. Um, you know, got into the Sunday Times bestsellers list, which was which was amazing. I wasn't expecting that. I didn't quite know what to expect when it came out. Um and yeah, I mean that was very, very overwhelming, and the reception from the Arsenal fans has been has been great. And uh, yeah, I'm very, uh, very thankful for it. Just goes to prove that Arsenal fans do go out and buy books, you see, or, or download books and whatever. Charles, I'm gonna, I could, I could actually talk about this for most of the day, but I'm going to crash the news in a minute. Uh, Charles, if people want to, yeah, who'd have thought it? If people, and I won't, we didn't even get on to habits, but there you go. If people want to, <laughs> if people want to talk, to find out more about you or about the book, uh, where can they go? Well, I find me on Twitter or X, whatever you call it now, uh, at Charles underscore Watts. I've got my own YouTube channel, Inside Arsenal. Uh, just search for that, Inside Arsenal, Charles Watts. And the book, I mean, you can buy it off Amazon. You can buy it off all the good retailers now. It's it, it's all there. And I think there's still a few very limited signed copies you can get, um, which I've done for Goldsboro Books, which is a very famous bookshop in Common Garden, where I went in and did a bulk load of signings. Um, there is still a few there left, but uh, once they're gone, they're gone. So if you want to get a signed copy, search Goldsboro Book Arteta Revolution and it will, uh, it will come up. And the v- book will also be available as a virtual download. You can order it from our own virtual bookstore as well. The book is called Absolutely. Revolution, The Rise of Arteta's Arsenal. It's by Charles Watts. Charles, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Charles.